Um, I am a zoologist and I don't know very well what is happening in the social sciences or in engineering, etc. So the examples I'll be giving you are mostly from the Faculty of Science. That's something I know a bit about. Um, obviously, I'm trying to keep this fairly general. So I suppose 90% of what I'll tell you today is relevant to everyone. What, whatever is not relevant, perhaps go see your supervisor afterwards and find out, is that how we do it in our faculty as well, or do we do things differently? All right, so I'll speak a bit about scientific writing. Proposals, theses, and publications. Uh, many of you might be busy with proposals right now. Can I have a show of hands? Who's busy with that? All right. Who's finished already? Who's, who's, who's uh, submitted their proposal? Okay, so we have a few of those as well. For you, it's unfortunately too late. But uh, there's some advice here that might still be useful for you. Uh, traditionally, you would do the proposal and then you forget about the other things for a while until you have perfect results, etc. That is not a good strategy. At this, at this uh, point, I would like to explain to you how sorting out your life in the beginning, setting everything up nicely, will prevent the chaos that usually happens towards the end. So, essentially your scientific writing comprises three stages. And traditionally you would do the proposal, then you would do your research, your field work, whatever, and you would write up a thesis or a dissertation. And then, once that has been sent to the external examiners, returned, corrected, and approved, you can graduate and then you can consider, hey, some of this stuff is good, maybe we can publish it. If you do it like that, you will not graduate. You will maybe add another year to your studies. So last year, I was giving a very similar presentation, except the people who I was talking to were towards the end of their postgraduate time. And they, they didn't enjoy this presentation very much. They pretty much rushed out afterwards to get their lives sorted out quickly, you know? They thought they were almost finished, they were not. They were far from it. So now, this is much better that I get a chance to talk to you guys now, so you can put your life on track immediately. And there's a, a, a lot of uh, practical ideas that I would like to share with you. So, stage one, the proposal. There are a few things that you can already learn at this point. You obviously have done a literature review, you have read a lot of papers, right? Very good. There's different ways of doing that. I'll, I'll talk a bit of, about how I'll do it. Um, then you can improve your scientific writing skills. You obviously improve that all the time. If you see now uh, pr the Pratt reports or whatever, you, or the essays you've written at third year level, they're ridiculous, right? You have improved at this point. But you will have to improve a lot more to graduate. And another thing that is also relevant at this point is reference management. And in this particular context, I would like to talk about learning how to use a reference manager that will make your life so much easier in the long run. I have only learned how to do that last year. I did one of these library courses. So if you, you see, you can teach an old dog new tricks. If I can figure it out, and I barely know how my cell phone works, you can also do it, you know? You just have to go through the effort to teach yourself how to do that. I'll give you a, a general outline of, of how this is ideally done. So at this point, what you essentially have here is already the skeleton of your thesis. Literature review. Okay, uh, coincidentally, while you guys were enjoying your holidays, I was working on a book chapter. I read more than 200 papers over the holidays. That is easily four times as much as I read during my PhD. And at this point, uh, I do things very differently from what I, how I used to do it back then. I was a bit chaotic in those days. Now I'm really organized. I have, first of all, I obviously read lots of papers keep the ones that are useful, throw out the ones that are not useful, and then essentially have lots of PDFs either in, in the thesis folder or in all sorts of subfolders, just so I know where to find them afterwards. I go into the PDFs, I highlight them, I make comments, and then one thing I do is I copy relevant sections and put them into the Word file. This is already the paper or the thesis. Essentially, you just copy and paste stuff in the beginning. Obviously, you can't leave it at that. That is plagiarism. But uh, this gives you a sort of a, a basic outline. These are the useful references, and now I tell my story around this and improve it from there onwards. 
So the proposal is essentially the starting point of your thesis. It's not something separate. And I know it's not something separate because very often when I read a thesis, the students will write something like, I will do field work and I will analyze it like this. They have obviously copied and pasted from their proposal. They haven't changed the future tense to the past tense. At this point, they've obviously done all of it already. But it gives you an idea. This is how your thesis starts or your dissertation. So when I say thesis, I mean thesis or dissertation, obviously. At this point, you will already have written something like an abstract. You will have an introduction where most of your literature review goes. You will have methods. This is very important at the proposal writing stage. Obviously, the fact that the, the departmental members need to get an idea, is your research feasible at all? And to do that properly, they need as much information as possible so they can criticize you constructively. Obviously, you don't have results in discussion yet, but you can have a working hypothesis. You can sort of suggest this is what I expect to find. And then there's obviously the references in the end. Very important. You don't have so many yet, but at this point, it is a very good idea to get organized when it comes to references. I will not talk so much about the scientific writing itself today, because that is a lot of information. One thing I have done is uh, I have compiled a list of trends, common errors, things that I come across very often. This is in many cases taken straight from direct criticism of my, what my students were writing. And uh, I will make this available on a website for you to download, so I don't have to read everything to you now. Maybe just a, a brief overview of what might be useful. Here's a document. Bit of a few things on basic formatting. What, what often strikes me is that uh, people have been working with MS Word for years and still don't know exactly how it works. I had a, a colleague from UKZN who, who got his PhD and he, who was, he was going to turn this into a, into a scientific paper. And one of the requirements is double spacing. And so he typed a line and then left an empty line and he typed another line and left an empty line. If you, if you add one word to this, the whole thing will shift and it will be complete chaos. So make sure you know the basics of Emma's word. Be surprised, there might be quite a few more tricks that you are not really aware of. So talk to your supervisor or some colleagues. Uh, there's a bit on formatting here. Track change is obviously important, how, how does that work? Keeping track of different versions is absolutely crucial. Don't have something like manuscript and then manuscript final version and then manuscript really final version now, and, and so it goes on, you know? Number them, version one, two, three. Every time there is a major change, give it a new number. Because to your supervisor, nothing is more frustrating than reading through this and thinking, wait a second, I've seen this before. I've corrected all of this before. What is going on here, you know? Then your supervisor will ignore you for a month. <laughs> Don't do that. What else? Uh, section of the manuscript. This is a bit on the literature review here. And then obviously, when I mentioned, you know, I, I like to copy and paste elements. The introduction very often reads like it is a dumping site for all sorts of incoherent sentences. You obviously need to start expressing that in your own words from then on, you know? Otherwise, it is plagiarism. And the other thing is, when you write anything, there needs to be sort of a train of thought from from uh, starting very general and becoming very specific. So if, you, if you're studying poverty alleviation, for example, you need to start broad. You need to say, you know, globally, poverty is still a huge issue. In Africa, it is particularly a problem. In South Africa, certain communities are affected. And then you can say, OK, and then we studied a community in Fentersdorp to look for trends. You see, it starts very global and becomes more and more specific. Don't start with. Uh, in this paper, we report a field work from uh, Fentus Dorp, South Africa. That's not going to get anyone interested, you know? Uh, methods, there's all sorts of advice here on how not to do things. Uh, punctuation and spelling, obviously, this is something that can drive your supervisor nuts. Comma, uh, commas in the wrong place can change the meaning completely, you know? You might have heard of this one here, eats, shoots, and leaves, instead of eats, shoots, and leaves. Yeah, there's sort of uh, all sorts of advice, things I've come across. 
This is pretty much the only thing that is specific to my field. If you're not into zoology or botany, you can ignore the taxonomic stuff there, but everything else I think should be uh, useful for everyone else as well. Good, so that will be available online, among other documents. Um, and uh, what else? Yeah, when it comes to scientific writing, um, there, there are online resources to improve your ways. And I also have a couple of links for that. Uh, WITS has just started a course for scientific writing for postgrads. I'm not sure about you, Jay, they, they're planning something like that. So maybe look out for that. As soon as it happens, register immediately because it is really, really useful. Okay, that brings us to the reference managers. There are lots of them. The library here likes Mendeley, is that right? And uh, I've, I, have, I have obviously also learned how to do it in Mendeley. For some reason, I switched to Zotero. I don't know exactly why. And perhaps it doesn't really make a difference because, are you trying to comment? Oh, you do ref works. Okay. Just, just to, to give you an idea, this doesn't matter so much. Essentially, I started in Mendeley, and then uh, I, just, I thought, ah, Zotero sounds cool, I like that. Exported the whole thing to Zotero, it's exactly the same. So the reference managers are all very similar and they're interchangeable. You can also get your supervisor's entire reference list if you're doing very similar research. So how, I, I just wanna give you a quick demonstration because this is so amazing, and this is something I just learned very recently, you know? Years ago, I had like 300 references and I just did everything by hand. Very tedious. I won't do that again. So essentially what happens, you start, you, you're looking for a good article, here it is, here's the, the journal website, and uh, your reference manager, if you have installed it correctly, there will be a little icon in, uh, on your Internet Explorer, whatever you use. Uh, the icon will change as soon as it has recognized this, and if you click on this, it will essentially put the reference into your reference manager, into, into your, your own personal library. You have to go through this carefully. Sometimes into it, there are some errors in it. For example, in the title, everything is capitalized, so it causes some inconsistencies. Um, it's not that the reference manager is doing something wrong, it's the website's fault. So some websites are better than others. Then you're busy writing, and you want to insert this reference now. So in this case, I essentially click on uh, add edit citation and I type a, one of the author names or the title that I vaguely remember and lots of suggestions come up. I pick the right one and it inserts the reference. The real beauty of this is uh, when it comes to your reference list because what you really do is you just click a button here, that's it. And you have 60 pages of thesis references within a few seconds. Of course you need to make sure that your library is correct. So there will always be a few errors in there. For the scientists, for example, it doesn't do italics of species names. It doesn't know what a species name is. So a few things you have to fix by hand. Even better, imagine now you've, you've uh, submitted a paper to a journal and it has a very specific style and they rejected it. What I used to do in the past is Okay, we need to find a different journal, and I found one that has a very similar referencing style because I was too lazy to change it, you know? That would have taken me two days or something. Now I just look for the different style, click a button, and everything changes. Entire formatting is fixed. So, my recommendation is, as soon as these guys do a course, you should be here right away. Or, or perhaps if someone else in your department is using a reference manager, just, let them uh, give you a demonstration. It is extremely useful. You will need this. Don't leave it to the last moment. Good. Apart from that, other advice is obviously, now is the time to get organized. You, you think you are very busy right now. You've seen nothing yet. Now is, the time, now is the time when you really need to sort things out, put everything into place. If you're organized now, things will be smooth from then on. So, when it comes to Organizing meetings, you obviously need to see your supervisor all the time, as, as often as possible. In, in our department, we just uh, basically am among the students, so they see me all the time anyway. 
They don't even need to make an appointment. I heard in the social sciences, the students mostly work from home, so they need to make an effort to see their supervisor, but they need to do that on a regular basis. When they do, they need to show up prepared. And they need to remember that they need to be proactive. This is their thesis, not the supervisor's thesis. He's got his own already. So you need to, you need to show up prepared. You don't need to sit there and, uh, and, and uh, ask, uh, 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 sorry, Prof, what must I do this week? You know, that's not what, what, what they want to hear. Come up with your own ideas. Organize your own deadlines. Inform the supervisor. I like, I mean, I, I'm pretty simple. You use Google's, Google Calendar. We have our meetings then and then and then, and, and maybe send a reminder a week earlier so it's, you know when it's time to panic. What else? Share your written output regularly. And most importantly, don't share it immediately with the supervisor. Because if your, your English is terrible, which is very normal, even among first language English speakers, like you might have the commas all in the wrong place or lots of things misspelled, the supervisor's job is not to sort out your bad spelling. The supervisor's job is to focus on the meaning behind it, you know? So my recommendation is, if you have someone who's good with English, let them go through it first. So, so the supervisor can focus on what they really need to focus on. And then obviously, learn the skills that you will need. I've already mentioned MS Word, that would be very useful. Huh? Reference manager, a stats package. We, the university has SPSS, I've never used it in my life. I use R, but uh, it is probably a good idea not to rely on the StatCon guy too much, but to teach yourself how to do statistical analyses. And you'd be surprised, you get away with a, I don't know, you can have sort of five, five different statistical tests, that is enough. You have something like a pairwise test, like a t-test, and then something for, for more samples, like an ANOVA, and some correlation analysis, not much more than that, really. That is usually enough in most cases. What else? Okay, then you obviously need to have a healthy diet, and uh, get enough sleep, and sort of a balance between work and, and leisure time. Okay, I don't believe in that at all. You're not supposed to have a life at all. <laughs> You're supposed to work all the time. And if you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, get rid of them now. Because they will essentially try to waste your time. They will complain that you're not, not focusing on them anymore, you know? <laughs> you guys are an exception, of course. Your, your boyfriend is very supportive, but once, once he changes his ways, you, you send this SMS and the, that, the, sort that out. Also, if you have friends, get rid of them too, unless they are important to you. So you need to have friends who are other postgraduates or who can help you a bit, you know? Those need to be your friends from now on. You can dump them afterwards, but this is the priority right now. <laughs> All right, what else? Good, we're moving to stage two. Thesis or dissertation. And uh, the best advice I can give you here is don't worry about that too much. That is not so important. Traditionally, it was like this. People would write this up. It would come back from the examiners. They would graduate and they would have created a beautiful dust catcher for the library that looks like hundreds of others. And the only people who would ever see this thing are pretty much your parents, maybe up to three examiners. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Less than 10 people will ever see it. So, obviously this is a requirement, you need to do something, yeah? But my, my recommendation is, uh, see what's on the next slide. Oh yeah. Let's jump straight to, to stage three. And this is, I think, it, at UJ that not all universities have implemented, but I think it is a really, really good development. You need to publish ASAP. If you, if you read the regulations, at least in science, if you read the calendar 2020, it says that in there. If you haven't got a paper, you're not gonna graduate. You can essentially complete your thesis, everything's perfect, and then you can register for another year without any bursary support, just until you have published a paper, and then you sort it. The rules are a bit more relaxed for MSc. You need to produce something that at least looks like a paper. This is not bad. This is a good starting point, you know? Because in many cases, we build on that. That eventually does become a paper. For a PhD is a bit stricter, obviously. You have three years to do this. So you need to have this submission-ready manuscript, and you need to have one published or at least in press. 
Without that, no PhD. So, in other words, start working on the paper as soon as possible. Don't worry about the thesis or the dissertation too much because that's a byproduct. <laughs> okay, when I, say, when I say paper, publish, what format? This, this is obviously, this might be different between different faculties. Some people essentially take the, their PhD uh, thesis and put it on this ProQuest or some other online site for everyone to read. Total waste of time because the library already has this as a PS, PDF and no one's gonna look at it anyway. Exactly. Yeah, you don't need that. It's already there. And still no one's gonna read it, but it's good it's there, you know? <laughs> or this, uh, the social sciences, they, they like to do this here. They, they like to turn the thesis into a book. Yeah, I can't read it. It's, it's, it's most definitely social sciences. They, th that's how they do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, in my faculty, this doesn't count. This is not peer reviewed. All this is, this got feedback from, from some external examiners, but those may, may be buddies of your supervisor, you know? That's a bit biased, you know? That's not ideal. You need anonymous feedback. So ideal is one or more journal articles. And this is obviously the starting point for your career. I mean, if you, if you have published your honors work, you'll get a job anywhere, you know? That's something special. I, I haven't done it. I started at master's level and then even late. So uh, I'm not sure if you can see this from the back. Here are some of my earlier publications. Oof, 2000, I'm getting old. Um, you have four here. The first one has been cited once. The next two more than 100 times and the, um, the last one 31 times. Can anyone imagine what's wrong with the first one? What have I done wrong here? That's my dissertation there. See how useless that is? <laughs> and I know the guy who cited that because it was myself. That's it. <laughs> you, you get the idea. It contains the same information as the other three, but no one's gonna look at it. Ugh, a dissertation, forget it. Yeah? <laughs> but it's still good you're doing it, you know? You can also see the difference between the international ones and the local journals, you know, the international ones, even though they're not really much better, they get cited four times as much, roughly. So, publishing is important. That's, your career depends on this. It's also important to self-promote yourself. It's not, not enough anymore to just publish something. It is also important to get known and to get people to read your stuff. And in the age of social media, this is obviously fantastic for a scientist to self-promote like crazy. You know, we use Twitter a hell of a lot. So you put this on Twitter, there's all sorts of metrics. Of how much online attention did your article actually get? Did it get some awards? Did it, did it result in any newspaper articles? There's even a video. It didn't get a hell of a lot of upvotes, but uh, at least, you know, if anyone's interested, they can have a look, you know? One thing you need to bear in mind is that publishing takes time. This is a recent example for my, my student, Nokolon Duli. Um, she submitted this submission-ready manuscript from her dissertation in August 2018. And then she got a job somewhere, and we all kept working on this. And then earlier this year, it finally got published. It's a completely different paper now. The title is different, it's got different authors. It has changed a lot, you know? Just to give you an idea, this, the, the strategy at UJ that you, you submit a submission-ready manuscript at MSc level is, is okay, I think. You can see it takes time to publish something. PhD students have more time, obviously, and this is the reason why they can already have something that is at least in press. So my recommendation is now that I've talked a bit about papers, what about the thesis? And here's a trend that I see absolutely everywhere these days. I, I'm an external examiner for a lot of uh, international theses these days. And what you can see here is, uh, this is one of my students. She's essentially, she has put the papers into the thesis and then essentially slapped a general introduction and a general conclusion around it. And uh, references and then lots of appendix stuff to make the whole thing look a bit more impressive, you know? Because a, a paper is obviously short and to the point. You, you don't waffle so much in the paper. 
This is the, the way to go, I think. The, the alternative in our faculty is that you only submit the papers. So this is entirely possible, that you have a, a PhD that is about this thin, and it has the papers in it. But it must be published in decent journals. Perfectly fine, except you need to say this in advance that you're gonna do it like this. And then if you, if you fail to publish everything on time, you have a problem. So this is the safest way to go about it. You can see, at this point, one was already published and one was in press. It was already more than what was required. So my recommendation is rather go for this option here. Have at least one in press. Good. Uh, this is something I also need to mention. This is a big deal now. And many of you might not even be aware of it. There has, uh, a decade ago, roughly, there has been sort of an increase in open access publishing. So you, you don't subscribe to the journals anymore. You pay for using them. Uh, so you pay for publishing in them. So you, you want as many people as possible to read your stuff, you pay. And this is perfectly legitimate. But a lot of clever people have picked up on this. And what they're doing is now, they have ex essentially produced fake journals. They don't really exist. There is no review. You send, you send them your, your paper. Um, there's no, they don't send it out to anyone. They sort of accept it. They don't do any proper editing or anything. And then they publish it a week later. And then you think, well, oh, great, I have a paper, you know? It's a good feeling in the beginning until you realize what's really going on. Because, uh, of course, I mean, you have to pay for open access, and this costs a lot of money. And it's entirely possible that this website will eventually stop to exist. So the police are onto them, and they will just shut down the website and come up with a new journal somewhere else. And your three years of PhD work is gone. You'll, it'll, it'll do nothing. Even worse, if you, I mean, the NRF and UJ and other universities are really clamping down on this now. And, and if you want to apply for funding from the NRF, for example, and they see that you have a predatory journal there in your list, you're disqualified right away. So you must be aware of this, and, and this is not easy. Let me just see if I can uh, show you an example. I have a link to a website here. Uh, there are a couple of these lists, but uh, many of them will likely be outdated because there are just so many journals. I mean, if you, if you go through this list here, look at this, thousands. There are probably more fake journals than real journals out there. Uh, and other things you need to look out for, hijacked journals. There might be a legitimate journal, but these guys have stolen the name and, or created a very similar name and created a separate website. And you think you have published something illegitimate and it's still predatory. There's even predatory conferences now. You can go to cool places, Buenos Aires, Sydney, organized by the World Academy of Science and so on. It doesn't exist, it's fake. This almost happened to an, an Indian student of mine. He wanted to go to Texas, Austin, Texas, you know? And, and he would have shown up there, uh, paid for a flight, paid for a hotel, paid for the conference registration, and then he was there by himself in the hotel, there was no one there. <laughs> so luckily I picked up on this on time, you know? This is a big deal. And these websites are not, not always shabby, you know? Many, many times it's badly spelled and so on. But this one here, you, you can win a, the young, student, uh, the young Scientist Award, for example. Fantastic stuff, you know? There's even legitimate people. Oh, th look at this guy. He doesn't even know he's, he's a keynote speaker on this, you know? No one has told him. They've just stolen his identity. So this is really something to look out for. So you need to be very careful. Let me just show you how big a deal this really is. Oh, just before I move on, uh, the conclusion is, of course, the solution is uh, you need to publish in DHET approved journals. And another thing I make available online is the actual list, which looks something like this. This is updated every year, and they're trying to weed out the predatory ones. There are a couple of weird lists there. I mean, DHET 2020 is, is probably safe because they, their own journals wouldn't be predatory, I hope. But the most authoritative is uh, WS 2020, World of Science, that is the, the ISI listed journals. There's still 50,000 to choose from, so choose one of these and not any of the others.
This is just an example from a, a recent uh, a paper that actually investigated how big a deal this is in South Africa. And what you see here is that these traditional white universities like UCT and Rhodes, they are not falling into the trap because they are very used to uh, having a high publishing turnover and they have their favorite journals, had, it, had them for years. But then you have universities like Univenda and Fort Hare, they publish what, a quarter of their publications are fake, you know? This is, they don't even seem to be aware of it. I have a friend who, who's a, a professor at Univenda and he published a, an article in Science, which is one of the top, the top journals. And it was the first time anyone at the university ever published there, and it was the highest ranking that anyone ever published in. And at the end of year Christmas party, the standing ovation went to some guy who published 15 papers in a fake journal. The admin people, I mean, the, the scientists are great, but the admin people are clueless, you know? And this is something really, you need to be careful. It's entirely possible that your supervisors may also not be aware of it. Obviously, this can, can sink your career before it even starts. And you can see at UJ, this is actually pretty bad there. UJ is in sort of in the midfield. One positive thing is that my, my faculty, shown in blue there, is probably not the culprit. <laughs> if you're in social sciences and humanities, <laughs> social sciences and humanities, but also economics, management sciences, they seem to do that a lot more. I don't know if this is at UJ, this is countrywide, but you see what a massive problem that is. So this is definitely something to look out for. If your supervisor decides, oh, there's this uh, Indian Journal of Social Sciences and Fishery Culture or something. They have sometimes really absurd names. Uh, it, it's, it's a cheaper open access price and they publish two days later, which is perfect. You can still graduate, you know? Just say no, rather register for another semester if you're running late. So as I say, your supervisors may not be aware of the situation as much as they should. And the librarians are definitely the go-to people in this case. This is also something I've come across. Of course, this is, uh, this is uh, dishonest students or lecturers. If you, I'm not sure if you can see that there, but uh, these, the, the title of these articles are suspiciously similar. Right? And uh, the interesting thing is that the guy essentially published the first one, didn't get cited a lot, and so he took the same article and sent it to another journal. And you can see the second one looks a bit more professional, but that is actually the predatory one. So if, if an employer sees this, that you have double dipped, you're out. One exception is, uh, this is a, a new trend here, preprints. This is acceptable. You essentially have your paper ready, but now it might take a while until it gets published. So before you submit it anywhere, you make the preprint available. Uh, in, in our field, in biomedical sciences, we use bioarchive. It's sort of roughly formatted, and as soon as it is published, a link will appear to the actual article. So this is, this is very good. It, it gets some exposure, and very often you can get feedback from people who have read it, and you can include this feedback in your real paper. So definitely worth considering. And then obviously when it comes to publishing papers, be prepared for criticism. It's anonymous, and when, whenever something is anonymous, people will try to troll you. They will try to show you that they're geniuses and you're clueless. Of course, maybe you are a bit clueless, but you've got to start somewhere, you know? So don't let this put you down. I know all the lecturers from the days when it wasn't compulsory to publish, who would just completely stop publishing because they couldn't handle the rejection. Same with myself. If I have something better to do, I ignore the response of the journal until I really feel like looking at it, you know? That's how serious that is. You essentially, you have this creation. You have your baby here. You've worked in this for three years, and now they're telling you your baby's really ugly, you know? <laughs> so, what can you do? Go have a drink. Mourn for a week, take a holiday. You need to bounce back. You come back after a week, and then maybe in, in this massive rant days, maybe some constructive criticism. And you can use that to make your baby look a bit better, you know? And then you try again. So don't let this put you off. You cannot afford to waste time. Okay, this is something uh, that we, in, once you're an established lecturer, you would do something like this. You think you have brilliant work here? And you're obviously the higher 
the impact factor, which I've added on the left here, is the more prestigious the journal is, which means that your article, if it gets published there, is probably really good, and more people are going to read it. We call that the downward spiral. We throw it in there, and it comes back after a week. Reject. Send it somewhere else. Reject. And so it goes on. This, this is an extreme case. It took us three years to get this really good uh, paper into still a respectable journal with an impact factor of six. That's pretty good, you know? And it's not entirely clear why the others rejected it. They misunderstood it sometimes, you know? But uh, obviously, this is what we do as established lecturers. We can waste some time. You can't do that. You need to at least have something in press. And my recommendation for what you should do if you do a PhD, where you need something in press, I mean, with an M, it's a different story, obviously. Maybe publish two different ones, at least. So in, in our case, we will, we will send a technical paper somewhere, ideally one of these bigger, faster, open access journals that have a fast turnover and where it get, will get accepted and published quickly. Then we can focus on the big paper. And as I've shown you earlier with my MSc student, it took almost yeah, one and a half years to finally have a, a, a good paper out with additional work. You know? But that is fine. You don't want to waste your, your brilliant paper on a bad journal that no one's going to read just because you are under time pressure. So make sure you publish something small and nice as soon as possible, maybe in a local journal. Good, um, I think that's all I have to say now. Uh, if you would like to read up on any of this, I have all the slides on my website, a bit on scientific writing. I have this year's list of accredited citation, uh, publications, and I have an article on predatory publishing and how you can how you can spot a fake journal or a fake publisher. So all you need to write down is, is that URL, which I'm gonna leave up there. Good. That means, thanks very much.